This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Thank you so much, Rish Koyla, Rabbi Bieberfeld, for the very kind and generous introduction. I'm quite humbled to witness, and I can attest to the tremendous reverberations that this Koyla has to the entire community and beyond. The effect that Torah has on families, on neighborhoods, on communities is an eternal uh, ramification. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu Shigif Siyata Deshmaya to the Rosh Koilel. I want to give a special thank you to Rabbi Zephrin, who I had the good fortune to be in contact with on numerous occasions about every step of the way and every drasha and the amount of koichas he put into the entire weekend. And I'm grateful for his friendship. I want to give a special Akara Satoiv to the Propis Mishbacha and their very warm and gracious hospitality. I've learned so much from being in their wonderful home. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu be mevarech them with continued bracha v'hatzlacha. And for all those who are friends of the Koilel and support the Koilel and support the Torah, while you are supporting the Torah, our humble bracha is, may the Torah support you, elevate you, raise you up, in good health, gezint, nachas, ad bias goyel tzedek. April 19th, 1943. Only three Rabbanim are still left in the Warsaw Ghetto. Three Goine Oilam. Rav Shimshin Shtakhammer, we spoke about him last night, Rav Menachem Zemba, and Rav David Kahana Shapiro. These three Rabbanim convened in one of the most frightful decisions in recent Jewish history. And they only had one hour to decide. They had just received word from the Judenrat that they were sent a message from the Catholic Church of Warsaw that they have 24 hours to get out of the ghetto and then their lives would be spared. They had 60 minutes to decide, otherwise they were going down with the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. Just to paint the picture of the deplorable conditions that the ghetto was in, 1943, no language has ever been created to describe the wretched conditions of the Warsaw Ghetto. I read to you an article of an eyewitness account of what the ghetto was like. This was written by my grandfather, Zechot Tzak Levracha, Rav Mordechai Leib Gladstein, who wrote in a book entitled Theological and Halachic Reflections of the Holocaust. He writes as follows, Ani hagever ra ani b'shevet evrasai. I am the man who saw the affliction of his people. I am the witness and I am the victim. I saw the Warsaw Ghetto littered with corpses, faces distorted and swollen, their eyes open wide, and blood everywhere, skulls crushed, rivers of blood, the blood of our children, of our brothers and sisters, our fathers and mothers, no imagination, no matter how daring, could conceive of anything we lived through, writes my grandfather. In 1942, my great-grandfather, Zechot Tzak Levracha, the last Rav of the city of Sachachov, was taken to the Warsaw Ghetto together with my grandmother. As soon as they get there, the Gestapo grabbed my grandmother's brother, Tzvi Hersh. Nobody ever saw him again. That was the horror and the terror of the Warsaw Ghetto. And friends, between me and you, there's very little that these rabbis could do for their constituents, and for their respective kehilos at this 11th hour. To make matters worse, this was April 19th. Tomorrow, April 20th, was the birthday of the Fuhrer, Yamach Shemoy. And executioner Himmler declared that as a birthday gift to Hitler, the Warsaw Ghetto would be annihilated. And people are running into Menachem Zemba's homes with problems 
nobody should ever have to hear with problems pressing on the hearts. Here, you know Rav Menachem Zemba, world-renowned Talmud Chacham, he was offered to be the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, which he declined. Upon the untimely passing of Rameir Shapiro, he was offered to be Rav of Lublin and Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva Chachmei Lublin. Before age 40, Rav Menachem Zemba was the honorary secretary of the Mayetzes Gedoyle HaTorah in Europe. My grandfather was a Ben Bayes by Rav Menachem Zemba, and he says behind his dining room table, there was a Svarim Shrank, a bookcase. And that bookcase contained not Svarim, but tens of thousands of pages of Chidushe Torah that Rav Menachem Zemba wrote. Thousands of pages on the entire Rambam called Machse HaMelech. A commentary on the entire Yushalmi. Hundreds of tshuvas, chedushim on Bavli, on Shulchan Aruch, on Medrash. And tragic scenes are taking place in front of the eyes of Ramanachim Zemba. Here you have a husband. He comes in with his wife. They have a way to escape the ghetto. The only thing is the woman, she's scared to go. She has a very noticeable Jewish nose. She's afraid she'll be caught. Or she has an elderly parent. Or she just could not bring herself to leave. But she didn't want to hold back her husband from saving his life. And against their will, they came to Menachem Zemba to get a get in the 11th hour. Dozens of people lining up in the home of Menachem Zemba to get divorced against their will. And the husbands were crying, and the wives were crying, and Rabbi Menachem Zemba was crying, and my grandfather said, the Mizbeach itself was Yorei Demois. This is just a flavor, a taste of the atmosphere of the Warsaw Ghetto in April 1943. And these three Rabbanim have 60 minutes to decide whether they should stay in the ghetto together with Achenu Bnei Yisrael, or get out and save their own skin. And they convened a Bezdin. Rav Shimshin Stockhammer, Rav David Shapiro, and Rav Menachem Zemba. And certainly, this is Dine Nefashos, this is a capital case. And when it comes to Dine Nefashos, Poischin Bakatan, you start with the smallest one, with the youngest one. And they offered Rav David Shapiro to voice his opinion first. <coughs> And Rav David Shapiro declares from the depths of his soul, we can't help our people. But if we stay with them and we encourage them and our presence will give them support, will strengthen their hopes, this is the only thing I have the strength to do. I don't have the kayak to leave my people. Can we run from the Almighty? The same God that is found here is found outside of the ghetto. And Rav Shimshin Shtakhammer and Rav Nachem Zemba are dumbfounded at this Psak Halacha. Whereupon Rav Nachem Zemba gives a clap on the shtender. That's the Psak. There's nothing more to say. There's nothing else we could say. We're staying here. They inform the Judenrat. They're not going anywhere. And come what may, they will die with the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. I heard this story about Rav David Shapiro from Rebbe Hanan Zon, who was the head of the Hebrew Kaddish in America, and he had a personal family connection to Rav David Shapiro. And he mentioned what a difficult time he had understanding the psak of these G'day Yisrael. Between me and you, it's very nice that these great rabbis stayed with the people, but what could they do with these people in the 11th hour? What kind of support could they offer? What kind of encouragement could they give? Could they really add anything to this wretched situation? Isn't the halacha, the chay, achicha, imach, chayecha, koidem? Rabbi Propus and I were discussing the sugya. Isn't there a mitzvah that when you only have one cup of water and two people need it, you drink it yourself? Doesn't your own life come first? It is a historical fact that many G'daylem, many Admoirim who had the opportunity to leave and save themselves from the horrors of the Holocaust, while thousands of their Talmidim and Hasidim were gassed or cremated, they took advantage of the opportunity. 
Many of the Hasidusim today are only due to the fact that the Rebbe's took advantage of the opportunity to save their own skin, while the rest of the Hasidus was destroyed in Europe. But they were able to rebuild. There's a future for Klal Yisrael today. There are yeshivas today. There are, there are courts of Hasidus today because these great rabbis took advantage of the opportunity that they were given. The Panovich Rav, Rav Yosef Shleima Kahanaman, 1941, the Jews of Panovich, they're taken to the Pajanest forest. They're murdered there. How many Rabbonim survived the Lithuanian Holocaust? None. There were no survivors. Except for the Panovich Rav. Rav Kahanaman was saved because he wasn't there. Because he was en route from Palestine to the United States Fundraising, like the Panovich Rav knew how to do. You know, they say, how do you know there's no life on Mars? Because if there was, the Panovich Rav would have fundraised there. <laughs> Panovich Rav missed the Holocaust. His wife, Rebetzin Fega, all the children were killed except for one. And at the Hakamas Matseva for the Panovich Rav in Bnei Brak, the Rosh Hashiva of Panovich got up, Rav Shmuel Rozovsky, and he said, you should know that the soul of the Panovich Rav knew no rest, no respite. He was beleaguered, he was plagued, he was haunted his whole life. Everything the Panovich Rav ever did was to somehow assuage the guilt that he had. Shehu hayochid shenitzel mikol rabon elita. He's the only rabbi who survived the Holocaust. Why did he fundraise everywhere? Boys' schools, girls' schools, yeshivas, Beis Yaakovs. What motivated the man? The man was on a mission. Says the Rav Shmuel Rozovsky, Shelo yehei bebechinas hitzalti es atzmi vesvinosi lo hitzalti. He didn't want to feel, I saved myself, but my ship went down. Many gedolim, on the other hand, demonstrated supernatural inner strength who had the opportunity to save their lives and their families and not only did they not save their lives they returned to the horrors of Europe Rav Chanan Wasserman he was in America he was in Yeshiva Taravadas Rav Shalim Haiman says Rav Chanan I will step down you will be the next Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva Taravadas Rav Chanan said what about my Talmidim Rav Gedal Yashor was procuring visas for many of the Talmidim of Baranovich Rabbi Hanan said, I ain't staying, I'm going back. Why are you going back? My children, your children, my Talmidim. Rabbi Hanan had a stopover in London. They begged him, Rabbi Hanan, you're going back, they're going to murder you on the spot. Rabbi Hanan said, I cannot abandon ship. And I am very proud to say, and it's also extremely painful, that my great-grandfather, my Elta Zayda, Rabbi Yehuda Leib Volman, Hashem Yimka Imdamai, the last Rav of the city of Sachachav, was offered by the Agudas Yisrael of America, a very prominent position in America, Chief Rabbi of America, to save him and his family. And he said, I'm not going. A faithful shepherd doesn't forsake his flock. And this is the fateful decision Rav Shloima Kahana, Rav David Shapiro, Rav Shimshin Stakhammer, Rav Menachem Zemba have to make. By the way, tell you a little bit what happened to Rav Shimshin Stakhammer. He somehow made it out of the ghetto. He was taken to a forced labor camp near Lublin, and he lost his entire family. And with great Mesir Nefesh, that was April 19th. He made it out of the Warsaw Ghetto. It's now Erev Pesach, 1943. And the Rav Hammer baked matzahs together with a certain doctor and they sneaked the matzahs out of the camp. On their bodies they were caught and they were beaten mercilessly. Two years later, Pesach, 1945. 
Rav Stockhammer made an announcement, even though he was gravely ill, completely emaciated, he will not be eating chametz for eight days, which meant he will not be eating for eight days. They said, Rabbi, you know how to do this. You have to preserve your life. Rav Stockhammer said, believe me, I know the halacha. But there are 2,500 yidin in this camp. Somebody has to declare to the world, there's a Yom Tif of Pesach, there's an Indian of chametz, we have to eat matzah, and I'm going to be the one. And miraculously, Rav Shimshin Stockhammer went eight days without eating and survived Pesach 1945. At the end of the war, all the inmates were rounded up. They were put on a cattle car and they were headed west. The Russians bombed the tracks. Rav Stockhammer's track was bombed. He was mortally wounded. And on the 13th day of ER 1945, Rav Shimshin Stockhammer returned his holy soul to his creator three days before liberation. And Rav Ochanan Zon tells me, you know, I really did not understand the psak of these gedolim. What could they offer these poor souls, these emaciated bodies, these walking cadavers? Of what benefit would it be to them to have three rabbis in the camp? He said, Daniel, I never understood this until you read an article your grandfather wrote. My grandfather describes what life was like in the Warsaw Ghetto in the death camps and he asks, what provided us the secret mysterious strength and endurance to continue breathing? Recently at my grandfather's Levaya, a man came to Levaya on Har HaZesim with all of his children and he said, I want you to know why I'm here. Because your grandfather saved my father's life. Because so many times in the death camps, my father wanted to run to the electric barbed wire and kill himself. And your grandfather said, no, you're not allowed to do that. We're going to survive. The Yibar is going to protect us. My grandfather asked, what gave us this mysterious strength? Lule soiroscha sha'ashuai ozavadeti be'onyi. If not for the torch of Torah that provided me with light, with hope, with aspirations for the future, I would have given up. We had with us the Rabbanim of Warsaw, Rav David Shapiro, Rav Shimshin Stockhammer, many G'dayla Yisrael, and during those dismal and abysmal nights, they would say over Gemara's Balpeh, they would say over Lamdus Balpeh. They would say over Sfas Emes Balpeh. B'machashakim hoishivani ze Talmud Bavli. The Gemara that these precious Jews remembered and recited by heart served as the Ner Talmud, eternal light to illuminate these downtrodden, hopeless souls. Rabbi Zon told me when I heard the hope and the spiritual energy and the transformation that Yidin felt when they heard these Rabbanim saying over Torah, Tarshabal Peh, Gemaras, in the Gehenna, in the Purgatory itself. Now I understood why those rabbis felt they needed to be there, what they could do for these survi- for the potential survivors. And I believe that I am here today because of that fateful decision that Rabbi Nachem Zemba and Rabbi David Kahana and Rabbi Shimshin Stockhammer made to stay in the ghetto and give chizuk to these yidin by teaching Torah in the most impossible situations, I am here today, my children are here today because of that chizuk, because of that supernatural strength that these G'dayle Yisrael displayed. You know, we say every night in Marev, we say an expression, this expression is not an allegory, it's not a metaphor, it's not poetry, it's meant literally. What is the Torah to us? It's not a luxury, it's not a good deed. We say, Ki heim chayenu v'oirech yameinu. 
It's literally our life. It is the essence of life. And stripped of all earthly benefit, but if we have the Torah, we have life, we have life itself. That's the first element that I would like to discuss tonight. And that's what Akoilo brings to the community. As the centerpiece of the community, even if you don't go in the Koilo, you pass by a Koilo, you have the following message. The Koilo cries out, like it says in Mishle, Barosh Hoimiyos Tikra, the Koilo cries out, what is life for a Jew in this world? What is the Kihem Chayenu Va'erach Yaminu? Let's talk about a little bit of a more upbeat aspect of the Torah. Most people, you open up the Jewish magazines today, which is very dangerous. Very dangerous. You would think that Judaism is all about eating high caloric (laughs) carbohydrates. That's the main objective of being Jewish, especially when it comes to Shavuos. You would think the main avoida is consuming cheesecake. And cheesecake is quite important. Why do we eat dairy on Shavuos? Actually, it's, it's very interesting. The first reference to chalav on Shavuos is found in one of the earliest Rishayim, the Kalbai. But he says it's not just dairy, because the main source of eating dairy on Shavuos comes from the Pasuk and Shia Shirim, Tevash v'chalav tachas l'shaynech. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Where Shlomo HaMelech is saying, the Torah is so delicious, it's so delectable, it's so sweet, that it's a taste, it's a flavor of the combination of, mil- of honey and milk. So we have milk to commemorate the delectability of the Torah. And therefore the Kalbai suggests that we have honey as well. The Torah is so delicious, it's compared to honey. But the Chavetz Chaim focuses on the comparison between Torah and honey in another way as well. Chavetz Chaim always yearned for the Mashiach. He was a Koyen and he felt that when Mashiach would come, it would be incumbent upon all the Koyhanim to know how to do the Avodah in the Beis HaMikdash. And he wrote a sefer called Likute Halachos where he describes Halacha Lamaisa practically. How do we do the Avodah in the Beis HaMikdash? And in the introduction to Likute Halacha, the Chafetz Chaim tries to explain why is Torah compared to honey? Why honey? And the Chafetz Chaim says a mind-boggling analogy. Chafetz Chaim says even though honey seems like a rather innocuous food item, honey is actually the most powerful food known to man. You're going to love me for this one. Is there any way that a Jew would be allowed to consume treif meat? No, come on. You can't come up with a heter for that. We can. Right? So Chafetz Chaim, according to most Paiskim, the sweetness of honey, the power of honey is so potent that if bread falls in honey and it spends enough time there, it actually is transformed into honey itself. And what if a piece of chazer treif would fall into honey and stay there long enough? Says the Chafetz Chaim, according to most Paiskim, the meat would dissolve, disintegrate, and be transformed into honey, and you'd be allowed to eat the treif meat. You heard it here first. <laughs> Erev Shavuos, 2021. Says the Chafetz Chaim, that is why Tyro is compared to honey. Here you have a guy. Here you have an individual. They don't have the best of character. Stop shaking your heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're an angry person. They're an arrogant person. They have desires. But that's before they started becoming engrossed in Limar HaTayra. But once the Jewish mind immerses itself in the honey of Taira, honey is so powerful. It has such a potent ability to create sweetness that you could take the most rough and tough and gruff person. If the person immerses themselves in honey, 
in the Torah, they become transformed. We're going to read in Perkei Avos this Shabbos. The Torah is machshartoi liois tzaddik. The Torah kashers a person. Machshartoi doesn't mean it prepares a person. It says the Chavetz Chaim, it kashers a person. A person can have bad qualities, bad character, bad personality traits. By immersing in the Torah, it could completely transform a person to become a different individual, a different entity. It kashers the person. That's the analogy of Dvash v'cholov tachas l'shaynech. Rosh Kailal mentioned that he's a descendant of Chassam Seifer. Take the first letter of the Torah HaKadoshah. No? Base. Take the, take the last letter of the Torah. Lamed. So far, so good. Take the middle two words of the Torah, Daroish, Darash. So the middle two letters, the Shin of Daroish, the Dalet of Darash. So, so far we have a Bez, we have a Lamed, we have a Shin, and we have a Dalet. What's the middle letter of the Torah? The Ches of Gachain and the Vav of Gachain. Says the Chsam Soifer, you take the six end points and middle points of the Torah, Devash the Chalav, honey and milk. You want to know what the Torah is? You want to know how delicious, how delectable the Torah is? How sweet? How much satisfaction? How much inner joy? How much happiness the Torah offers us? It's like constantly indulging in honey and milk. Now if I were to ask you, every morning we wake up and we make a bracha on the Torah. We, we start, What is the nature of Berchus HaTorah? What type of blessing is Berchus HaTorah? So most people would say, I don't know, we always make a bracha before we perform a mitzvah, before you put on a talis, you make a bracha, before you put on tefillin, you make a bracha. Before you take a lul of an esrog, you make a bracha. Before you sit in a sukkah, you make a bracha. What is the nature then of Birchas HaTayra? You would expect it's a blessing you make before you perform the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. Says the Lavush, no, you're making a big mistake. Because Chazal say, what's the reason why in the times of the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, there were so few Talmidei Chachamim, there were so few learned people Alma of the Haaretz, Chazal say they were not making Berchas HaTayra. So the Levush is bothered. What do you mean they weren't making Berchas HaTayra? Because the Gemara says nobody could really figure out why did Hashem allow this to happen to them. And they asked the rabbis, the rabbis didn't know. They asked the, the angels, the angels didn't know. They asked the prophets, the prophets didn't know. Only God Himself was able to say they weren't making Berchas HaTayra. You know, hey, pal, this is not rocket science. Why, why couldn't anyone figure out? Go to shul, you'll see people are opening up the siddur, they're saying asher yatsar, they're saying alekai neshama, and then they're going straight to asher nosan lasach vivina. Nobody's making berchas hatayra. What's so complicated over here? Nobody knew they weren't making berchas hatayra. Says Lavush, avada, they made berchas hatayra. They said, Lasoik B'divei Soiro with so much kavana. They said, Asher Bachar Banu with so much kavana. But they missed the boat. They made a fatal error. They thought, when you're learning Taira, you're doing a mitzvah. It's like you're shaking a lulav and esrog. It's like you're saying, Berchus Hamazain. It's like you're sitting in the sukkah. So they made a bracha over their learning as if they were being mekayim a mitzvah. But birchas ha is not a birchas ha-mitzvah. Birchas ha is birchas ha It's a blessing that you make when you get enjoyment in life. When you eat pizza, you make a bracha. When you eat steak, you make a bracha. When you drink snapple, you make a bracha. Because asr la adam le hanois ba oilam hazeh bali bracha. One is not allowed to take enjoyment from this world without making a blessing. But wait a second. There's no enjoyment by shaking a lul of an esrog. The Gemara tells us mitzvah is lav la hanois nitnu. There's a principle that we are not considered to get joy from the actual performance of a mitzvah. A mitzvah doesn't give us a certain physical happiness. We're doing what God said. It's a responsibility that we have to execute. 
Nevertheless, says the Lavush, that's when it comes to 612 mitzvahs. But there's one mitzvah in the Torah that the mitzvah is defined by the following principle. Hashem says, I want you not to learn Torah. There's no mitzvah to learn Torah. I want you to derive enjoyment from the Torah. I want you to derive happiness from the Torah. I want you to derive inner satisfaction and joy from the learning. That's the mitzvah. That's the nature of the mitzvah. That's the qualitative nature of the mitzvah. There's no mitzvah just to learn. Abba, Daddy, where did you go tonight? Well, just like in the time of the Romans, where our lives were threatened and we risked our lives to learn Torah, even though we really didn't want to, and just like in the Holocaust, we risked our lives. I went to the Kailal tonight to learn. Boy, was it difficult, and I was sweating the whole time, but I did it like I shook a lulav and esrog. There's no such mitzvah. Yaakov, Rachel, you know where I went tonight? Tonight I went to, I, to derive great happiness and joy. Where'd you go? You went to the Phillies game? You went to the Flyers? No, I went to the Kailal. The Kailal, what were they giving? There, there was a barbecue in the Kailal? No, I was learning in the Kailal. Learning is the greatest happiness. Learning is the greatest joy. Learning is the simcha of a Jew. The parameter of the mitzvah of Talmud Torah is such, there is no mitzvah to learn, the mitzvah is to get an enjoyment from the learning. This even has halachic ramifications. The Avnei Nezer writes in his Akdama that if somebody made a nether, if somebody took a vow, that they're not going to get enjoyment from Ruvain. The only thing is, it's Rosh Hashanah, and, that, and Ruvain's the only guy with a shoifer. Can you blow Ruvain's shoifer on Rosh Hashanah? You took a vow, you're not going to get enjoyment from Ruvain, you could blow Ruvain's shoifer. Because blowing a shoifer is not considered enjoyment. You're doing a mitzvah. God said, do the mitzvah. Do the mitzvah. But if you took a vow, you're not going to get enjoyment from Ruvain, and you need a Gemara that Ruvain has, you can't borrow his Gemara. What do you mean? What, what kind of enjoyment am I getting from the Gemara? I'm just learning the Gemara. I'm, I'm just doing a mitzvah. No. The mitzvah of Talmud Torah is a mitzvah to enjoy the milk, the honey, the delectability, the, the way the mitzvah is qualified. It's a mitzvah of deriving pleasure. In fact, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the monumental words of the Arachayim HaKadosh and Parshas Kisavai. The Arachayim writes incredible words on the Pasuk, V'samachta b'chol hatayv. You should rejoice with all of the good. And the Arachayim HaKadosh says, what is truly good in this world? What is the epitome of good? What is the quintessential goodness that we have? Ein toiv ela toira. V'samachta b'chol ha'toiv, rejoice with all the good, says Arachayim HaKadosh. Im hoyu b'nei adam margishin b'mesikos v'arevos toiv ha'toira. If a human being would sense the sweetness, the enjoyable quality of the Torah, hoyu mishtagim u'mislahatim achareha, a person would insanely pursue the Torah. Nothing else in this world would have any value. If one would stop and recognize for a moment the great happiness, the great joy, the simcha that comes from learning Torah, they would blindly run after it and forget about anything else that exists in this world. The enjoyable quality of learning. But I want to share with you one more element of Torah. Yes, we know it's our life. We know it's been the life of a Jew for 3,300 years. Since that fateful day when the Rebbe Hashem spoke to Kal Yisrael and Har Sinai, you know, it's an interesting thing. In Shershirim it says that the nations of the world come to Kal Yisrael and they tell Kal Yisrael, come on, why are you still busy with your Judaism, with your Talmud, with your Gemara? 
Shuvi, shuvi, hashulamis. Return, return, you rose. Shuvi, shuvi, v'nechezabach. Return to us, v'nechezabach. We'll give you power, we'll give you position, we'll give you prestige. Just join us. And what's the response of Klai Yisrael to these attempts of the nations of the world? We tell the nations of the world, What could you give to us? Can you rival the dancing at the camps? You know what we tell the nations of the world? So Bibenfeld said, stubbornly, for 3,300 years, we say, nations of the world, what are you going to give us? We're going to become the President of the United States, we're going to become wealthy, we're going to become rich. You know what you have to compete with? You have to compete with the awesome experience of Har Sinai. That powerful experience of Har Sinai, you know, when the United States dropped the atom bomb, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, there's actually an interesting phenomenon that if anyone was standing in the vicinity of the atom bomb, the blinding light of the energy, of the nuclear energy of the, of the atom bomb, created a phenomenon called nuclear shadows. That means you had a guy standing like this at the bridge. The blinding light of the atom bomb seared an image of that person onto the bridge. And you could go there today and you could see the guy who 80 years ago was standing there and he seared, his image is seared onto the bridge. Nuclear shadows. Says Rabbein B'chaye, the awesome experience of Kabbalah Satar is so powerful. is such an eternal happiness that it is seared onto the soul of every Jew, so that 3,300 years later, we tell the nations of the world, what could you offer us? You think we would ever exchange in that awesome experience, that rendezvous with the Rebani Shalaylam? There's no competition over here. But I want to share with you one last nekuda when it comes to Liman Atayah. We've heard many times over this Shabbos, in Mechukai Sai Telechu, God says, if you follow my statutes, life will be good. It will rain, it will rain in May, it could rain in the middle of May. You'll have rain at the right time. Your stocks will go up, your portfolio will go up, you'll be happy, you'll be successful. In Mechukai Sai Telechu, which Rashi says it doesn't mean if you keep the mitzvahs, because uh, the next phrase is you'll keep the mitzvahs. And mechukai saiteleichu means shatiu amelim batayah. That if the Jewish people are engrossed and work and toil in Taira, life will be good. And the question is, how does Rashi know it means that we have to toil in Taira? Maybe it just means if we learn Taira, where do you see anything about toiling in Taira? Who says we have to work so hard? Granted, it means beyond just keeping the mitzvahs, you have to learn the Torah. Who said anything about Amelis Batayr over here? So famously, Rav Shmuel Rezovsky said as follows. It says in B'chu Kaisai Telechu, you will go in my mitzvahs. Go implies from level to level to level, you will raise yourself up. And while mitzvahs are very important, and chesed is wonderful, and tzedakah is incredible, and tefillah is vital, there's only one way to elevate yourself. And that is working hard in learning Torah. And if the Pasuk says, you're going to go up, you're going to elevate, elevation is only possible through amelas batayra. I want to share with you an astounding Vilna Gain. If I were to ask you, categorize the various types of mitzvahs we have, so we would say, there's Bein Adam La Makoim and Bein Adam La Chaveroi, between you and God and between you and your friend. The, the Gra reveals that there's actually a third category of mitzvah that I personally, I wasn't aware of this. And I think this is a very modern concept. That there are actually three categories of mitzvahs. Not only bein adam lamakam, bein adam chaverai. And there are actually three categories of averos. And the Gra bases this on a Gemara Msachim. Rav Sheishas. Rav Sheishas would review his learning every 30 days. He would then climb up to the top of the mast of a ship and he said, Chadoi nafshoi, Chadoi nafshoi. He would talk to himself. 
he would say, Rejoice, O soul! Rejoice, my soul! Reb Sheshesh would talk to himself. You do it, why can't he do it? <coughs> he would say to himself, Rejoice, rejoice! So the Gemara asks, Why was Reb Sheshesh focused on his own joy in the Torah? After all, when we know that when a person learns Torah, he upholds the entire world. So shouldn't he have had a more broad intention, more broad kavana? that the whole world is rejoicing in my Torah, and the Gemara says the following words, Me'ikara ki ovid inish adaite de nafshe ka ovid, which one would mistakenly translate, when you start learning, you start to learn for yourself. But that's not what the words mean. The word me'ikara does not mean in the beginning, as we're about to see. It says the Vilna Goyen and Sefer Devarim. There are three categories of mitzvahs. There's been Adam Lamakoim between you and God. There's been Adam Lachaveroi between you and your friend. And there's a third category of mitzvah between you and you. Bein Adam La'atzmai. So let's get some examples. What's Bein Adam Lamakoim? Prayer. You're communicating with the Almighty. It's Bein Adam Lamakoim. Chesed, the other pillar of the universe. Bein Adam Lachaveroi. Says the Gra, but the most important mitzvah in the Torah is not Bein Adam La Makoim, and it's not Bein Adam La Chaveroi, it's Bein Adam La Atzmai. Because God gave you a soul, and that soul has endless greatness and endless potential. So, how do you actualize your greatness? How do you bring out your abilities? How do you bring to the forefront the latent? Endless, infinite, divine nature that every soul has been imbued with. How do you become something? How do you make something of yourself? There's only one way to do it. You could pray. Prayer is great. You will connect with the Lord. And you could do chesed. You will connect with your friend. But you will remain the way you were. But how do you actualize yourself? Bein adam la'atzmai. The Gros says, likewise, there are three types of sin. Murder, that's bein adam lachaveroi. <laughs> that severs your... It's hard to have a relationship with the guy that you just murdered. They find it very difficult to do that. Avodizara, hard to connect with the Creator when you serve Avodizara. And illicit behavior, arayos, Noyef ish chasalev, you destroy yourself. On the other hand, chesed will connect you to your friend, to your neighbor, to someone in your community. Tefillah will connect you to the Almighty. But how do you actualize the greatness that rests inside of you? How do you become something? How do you elevate? There's only one way to do that. Talmud Torah. Learning the Torah makes you a greater individual, a greater soul, a greater father, a greater mother, a greater brother, a greater sister, a greater son, a greater daughter, a, a greater Jew, a greater everything. Says the girl, where do I get this from? I get this from Rav Sheshes. Rav Sheshes, every 30 days, he would say, Chadoi nafshoi, Chadoi nafshoi. Rejoice, Reb Sheshes. Rejoice, Reb Sheshes. This one's for you. You made something of yourself. Now we understand, says Rav David Kayin, Rosh Hashiva of Hebron. Rav Yosef on the Yom Tif of Shavuos, he made a Yom Tif. He said, if not for this day, El Mole Hayoima, if not for this day, Kamo Yosi Ika Beshuka, I would just be an ordinary Joe. But because of Shvuis, I'm not just Yosi. I'm Rav Yosef. Listen to the words of Rashi. Ilav Hayoima Shalamadati Toira Venisroi Mamti. I elevated myself. I became something. I made something of myself. How do you make something of yourself? So I don't know. I don't have it within me. I'm not that talented. I don't have such great ability. 
Rav Tzadik HaKoyin says the same way we have to believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we are likewise commanded to believe in ourselves. These are not two separate mitzvahs, it's the same mitzvah. Because if the Almighty gave us a soul and we're a piece of Him, the same way He has infinite greatness, so do we. So then how come uh, I'm still waiting for it to kick in? Friends, it's there. The greatness is there. The tool to bring it out is there. That's the happiness of Shavuos. The happiness of Shavuos is El Mole Hayoima Kama Yoisi Ika Veshuka. Says Reb Friedlander, if we could just examine one more line of Gemara. The Gemara has a question, why is Reb Sheshesh focusing on his own happiness? What about the fact that the whole world is benefiting from his Torah? Says Reb Friedlander, Meikara. Meikara doesn't mean in the beginning when you start, for starters. You should think about what it does for you. Meikara means primarily, fundamentally. Fundamentally, when we go to learn, yes, it's our life. Yes, it's honey and milk. It's enjoyable. It's happiness. But deep down inside of all of us, the greatest desire we have is that by traversing through this world for the short amount of time we have here, we want to at least make the most of ourselves. And that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us with the Torah. It is a tool to access the greatness that lays in our neshamais. We say every Shabbos, every Monday and Thursday when we put away the Torah, Eitz Chayim Hi, Lamach the Torah is a tree of life, literally, to those who uphold her, to the supporters, to the friends of the Torah, the Torah is a tree of life. But says Reb Chaim Velazhenar, this has another meaning as well. Says Reb Chaim Velazhenar, picture the following scene. A man fell into impassable rapids, and they're threatening to pull him under, and his life is in danger. And he's about to go down, and there's a tree growing from the riverbank. And with his last ounce of strength, he is able to grab the tree. Picture for a moment, friends. How are you going to hold on to that tree that's going to save your life? Well, even though I'm a righty, I'm going to grab that tree with my left hand, with my pinky, and see if it's going to hold me up. I don't think so. Your life's on the line. That's your lifeline. How are you going to hold on to that tree? You're going to hold on to that tree with every fiber of your being and every ounce of energy that you have because that's the Eitz Chaim. Says Rav Chaim Velazhenar, we live in a world, it's a challenging world. There's so many things that threaten to pull us under. There's so many desires. There's so many challenges. The Yetzirahs are difficult. The challenges of life are difficult. The hurdles, the curveballs, the fastballs. But we have a lifeline. And the lifeline is the Torah, the Chumash, the Nevi'im, the Ksuvim, Talmud Bavli, Shulchan Aruch. That's our tree of life. How are we going to hold on to the lifeline? How will we be dedicated to the Torah? When we can, when we're available, when it's convenient, we're going to dedicate ourselves with every fiber of our being, with every ounce of energy we have, with every emotional fiber. We're going to give it our all because the Torah is our life, the Torah is our happiness, the Torah is our joy, the Torah is the source is Kol HaToyev, it's Samachta B'Chol HaToyev. Says Reb Levi Yitzchak Abar Dechev, there's one Yom Tif a year, you can't spend the whole day in shul, davening and learning, there's one day a year, you gotta enjoy yourself. The Yom Tif of Shavuos, HaKol Moedim, the Be'ina Nami Lachem. You know why you have to enjoy yourself? Because you need to tell your children, you need to tell your husbands, you need to tell your wives, this Torah over here. I'm not twisting myself into a pretzel to torture myself to learn Torah. The Torah is my happiness in life. And when we're committed to the Torah in that fashion, 
says the Lavush, we're Zoicha to Banim, Uvnei Banim, Tamidei Chachamim, God fearing Jews, dedicated Jews, happy families, we're Zoicha to the Nachas that we're all hoping for. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu give us all the Siyata Deshmaya, then the merit of coming together this weekend to really elevate ourselves and elevate our commitment to the Torah. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu elevate the Karen HaTorah. Elevate Klal Yisrael and bless all of us with only Bracha Hatzlacha, Simcha Senachas, Ad Biasko El Tzedek. Thank you so much for hosting me. Bracha Hatzlacha. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Gladstein. I just want to offer a personal reflection. I feel like, and I'm sure that many of you have taken in the Urine that we had this, this weekend. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.